one of the co-sponsors of tonight's event. The Global Forum is a student-led organization dedicated to promoting global awareness, understanding, and citizenship throughout UCSD and the communities it serves through public lectures, panel discussions, and events. Tonight's event is the last event the Global Forum at iHouse will be having for the winter quarter. So to keep up to date on our upcoming events for the spring quarter, you can sign up for our e-newsletter at the registration table, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or check out our new blog site at ucsdgfih.wordpress.com. Just as a taste of things to come in the spring, some events we are working to put together include a discussion on Cuba, a career talk with a current employee of the U.S. State Department, and a co-sponsored event with the famous Israeli author, Ari Shavit. So stay tuned for more details. Also, we have just now launched our new YouTube channel. If you ever miss an event, or want your friends to see what has been going on at the Global Forum, subscribe to our channel by searching for the Global Forum at the International House UCSD in the YouTube search bar Looking, look for our logo and hit the subscribe button. Currently, we have two videos posted from previous events this quarter. The first comes from January 20th, when Aubrey Fox, Executive Director of the U.S. Office of the Institute for Ex Economics and Peace, gave a presentation on the Global Peace Index, the Global Terrorism Index, and the Mexico Peace Index. If you want to know more about how peace and violence is measured in the world, check out this YouTube video. Our second video comes from January 26th and from the event titled Voices of Islam, a Student Conversation, where Professor Babak Rahimi moderated a discussion with Muslim students at UCSD regarding their experiences here as well as the perceptions about Muslims in general. That is a video I think everyone here at UCSD should see. And now, please welcome to the stage a woman who needs no introduction, Eleanor Ellsworth. What a blessing it is to have each and every one of you here. It warms my heart. I have the privilege today of welcoming all of you and also especially our distinguished speaker and his beautiful and talented wife, there you are, who will be introduced later. Many of you knew my late husband, many of you did not. But by being here today, you help him carry out his vision of having this school develop a first-rate 21st century China program here at the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. He recognized the passion for excellence at this school and had great confidence in his leadership, as do I and all of us. Now, in that our speaker tonight is currently Vice Chairman of Kissinger Associates, I thought it fitting today to share with you the brief statement that former Secretary of State and National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger sent to me after Bob's death in 2011. And I quote, As we grow older, life becomes more and more lonely as the pillars on which we counted disappear one by one. Bob was one of those patriots who sustained our country and gave meaning to our personal life. Over the decades of our acquaintance, he always stood for principles I respect and was committed to concepts of service that have made our country great. He will be missed, but long remembered." End quote. I close by thanking you for your support and encouragement and engagement with the 21st Century China program and allow me to thank all of those on the team who have made this happen tonight. We do appreciate you very much. Susan Shirk, you are next. I do feel that the 21st Century China program at UCSD, which over the past 
uh, two or three years, we have been building into the leading program on contemporary China in the country, and we hope in the world, and one that aims to be very impactful, doing original research, much of it in collaboration with Chinese scholars, but research that can be used by policymakers and business people and informed citizens like yourself. So it's, um, and Bob Ellsworth was a very wise and wonderful gentleman who was uh, advised me personally and our Dean Peter Cowley in the development of the program at every step along the way. So I do feel that this program and including this annual lectureship is uh, his legacy. I, we had hoped to have another uh, one of these wonderful wise men with us this evening, Harold Brown, the former Secretary of Defense who lives uh, most of the time in our community. But uh, Harold, at age 80-something, had an athletic injury um, and uh, he hurt his um, Achilles tendon. So uh, unfortunately, he's not able to be with us this evening, but you'll see him at future events. Um, I also want to recognize uh, some of our founders who have been with us from the beginning in developing our program. And please stand up, Lily and Xiao Chi Lin, Marion and Quan So, Gail and Jeff Donahue, and of course, Joan and Erwin Jacobs, who's have been great, generous supporters to our school. So I was so pleased to learn that uh, Bob Hormax and Bob Ellsworth knew each other, liked each other, and worked together. Um, and that is another very nice connection that binds us all together. Bob Hormax is a great public servant. Uh, and one of the reasons that this lectureship is so great is that every year we are able to bring to you these models of public service. Uh, Bob, uh, most recently from 2009 to 2013, was the Under Secretary of State for Economic, uh, Energy, and Environmental Affairs. Uh, you'll know if you're a close reader of the New York Times that he uh, had, was very, very instrumental over the years, but especially in this last job, in strengthening the role of the State Department in economic policy. He previously had served from about 1969 to 82 in other jobs related to international economic policy at the National Security Council, U.S. Trade Representative's Office, and the Department of State. And uh, in between, he did some business at Goldman Sachs. Uh, he also is a scholar, a serious student and scholar of international economy. And his, his latest book, which I'm going to plug here, um, is The Price of Liberty, Paying for America's Wars, uh, in which he argues that having to pay for wars often leads to financial innovation in our country and in other countries. So um, Bob has been at the center of Obama administration efforts to work some very contentious economic and trade issues with China. Uh, he's a real China hand, uh, and I know he has some very interesting observations to share with us about China's economic policy and the uh, consequences for America. So it's my great pleasure to introduce him to you. Thank you very much, Susan, for that uh, lovely introduction. And I want to just
just say what a privilege it is to be here, uh, particularly to honor Bob Ellsworth, um, who was a friend, a colleague, a mentor, an individual uh, to whom I and many others looked up to for guidance, for wisdom, and for integrity. And Eleanor, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to meet you, and thank you for those lovely words. I, mean, I think Henry Kissinger and many others really understood the enormous contribution Bob made to our country and our world. So I want to thank you very much for the beautiful words and for the opportunity to meet you. Um, and I think that all of us who know or knew or even read about Bob should be inspired to be strong patriots in the tradition that he set for so many of us in this country. So thank you. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Susan and Peter for putting this together, um, organizing it. These things are certainly not easy to do, and uh, I very much appreciate it. Susan and I have known her for a very long time. Um, going back to the early years of economic normalization with China, and Peter and I worked together in the Obama administration, so this is really uh, sort of old home week in that respect. And I also I uh, want to mention a number of other friends who are here today. I love coming out to the San Diego area. Irwin and Joan Jacobs are not only great friends, but really our community leaders, our national leaders, and our world leaders, not just in terms of innovation, but in terms of commitment to a better world and a better society. So thank you very much for, for joining us uh, today. Um, the um, uh, other opportunity I had had here was to uh, spend some time with uh, Raphael and Melina uh, Pastor, who I think are here, if they're not here, on their way. Very good friends, people I've known from New York for a very long time. Larry and Carol B. and Tom and Marilyn Herman who are there as well. So it's a good chance for me to see a number of, of, of old friends and to sort of relive acquaintances. And part of, of life is developing a network of very good friends, people you enjoy being with, people you learn from, and people who are committed to the kind of uh, improvements in our society and our world that Bob Ellsworth exemplified. So thank you all, and thank all of you for coming in, the sponsors as well, because without sponsors, these things don't happen. So thank you very much for all the hard work and all the commitment, because if you don't have sponsors for events like this or others, it's really hard to put them on and get the kind of audience and the kind of participation that's needed in order to discuss some of these more complicated global issues. And China today is really one of the more complicated, but one of the more consequential subjects on the international agenda um, for all of us. And probably one that lends itself uh, too frequently to slogans and too infrequently to deep thought and understanding of really what is going on in terms of U.S.-Chinese relations. So I'd like to share a few thoughts going back to the very early stages of our relations with China and my own experience and then provide some thoughts as to where we are now and where we're likely to go in terms of Chinese reforms internally, but also uh, perhaps more importantly from an American point of view, how we ought to respond to the kinds of developments that are occurring in China. When I first started out um, working for Dr. Kissinger, my first job in Washington was working for Dr. Kissinger as a graduate student. I was still working on my PhD dissertation at the time, and he had a very small staff with no budget. So he was looking for people that he could get for cheap. Um, and who comes more cheaply than a grad student? And that's how I got the job. Um, so I was his junior economic advisor, but the person above me left relatively quickly because he didn't think Kissinger had much of an interest in economics, which was true. Um, <laughs> so it was an opportunity for me. But in any case, we were uh, early on confronted with the opportunity to develop um, relations with China right from the very beginning. And most of those at the very beginning were focused on security issues. There was no trade between the United States and China at all. In fact, there were strong laws in the United States that were very restrictive about any economic relationship between Americans and Chinese. You couldn't 
buy things there, you couldn't sell things there, you couldn't invest there. China was 2% of the global economy and uh, even a smaller percentage of global trade. It traded with a few nations in the region, but not uh, many others, certainly not with us. And at the very beginning, the relationship was largely about security issues. And security issues, and we tend to forget this at the time, were very important in the opening uh, of China. Mao Zedong concluded, particularly when he looked at the strategic situation China was facing, that there was a threat to China from the Soviet Union. And it wasn't his imagination. There were 42 Russian divisions, 42 Soviet divisions on the border of China at the time. And therefore, the opening to China in part was a result of Mao's conclusion that he needed to have a relationship of some sort with the United States. Now this was very delicate because the United States had been vilified by China for years and by Mao Zedong himself. So the visit of Kissinger was a secret visit and then of course Nixon went began to open things up. But in our first economic discussions with China, with Premier Joy Lai, um, there was someone there who knew something about economics. Joy Lai knew a little, but he didn't really spend much time on it. But the guy who was in charge of economics at the time, we talked about trade. What can we buy from China? What might China buy from the US? Could we provide export import bank financing? This guy said, we don't want there's nothing you have that we want, and we don't want to trade with you at all. Um, this was his first comment. The guy didn't show up at the second meeting, um, because the Chinese begin to think, well, perhaps there was something that could be done in the economic area. But in any case, there was very little trade, very little in the way of economic interaction. And this took place for a number of years. Deng Xiaoping, began to realize that if he was going to open up China, he needed to open up China with respect to trade and investment. And who was the biggest investor and trader in the world? That was the United States. So he did several things. First of all, he had this trip to southern China where he pressed for internal reforms. But he also knew that part of internal reform was to expand China's trade and investment relations with other parts of the world, and in particular, and this is something that I think doesn't get as much attention and for which he doesn't get as much credit. He allowed 10,000 Chinese students to study abroad, many in the United States. This was considered a very radical move. This could never have taken place under Mao Zedong, but it did under uh, Deng Xiaoping. And I remember I had the pleasure of spending some time with Deng in a very small group, and he um, and I was commenting on some of his reforms. He'd just come back from his trip to southern China. So he puts his hand on my, touches my knee and said, young man, he said, that shows you how long ago this was. Um, he said, young man, there are 10,000 Chinese students studying abroad. When they come back, they will change China. So he understood it wasn't just about trade and investment. It was about ideas. It was about people getting experience from the rest of the world. Then fast forward to Zhurangji, who I think was one of the great heroes of China, particularly in terms of his reforms. He was the person, and Susan knows this very well, she was very much involved in it. He was really the person in China who pressed very hard for China to join the World Trade Organization. Now, this was important in part because it gave China opportunities in foreign markets, but even more importantly, because he knew that China had to change internally. And it could not change internally without some help. And the help that he saw was if they joined the WTO, there were many rules that it would have to abide by to be a member of the WTO. And those rules, in many cases, required reforms of regulations and laws and a greater degree of opening in China. And so he realized that one way of reforming China internally was to use the pressure of joining the WTO to make the kind of changes that were required internally in order to, um, to be a member of that, of that institution. And this was something that I think most Chinese understood. Now, 
One of the things I think it's, it's useful to bear in mind about the period now and the period then is with dumping economic interests, because China didn't really have much of an economy, it certainly didn't have an economy that engaged with the world. His main problem was to deal with the remnants of the Mao period. People didn't want any interaction with the United States at all. Zhu Rongji had to deal with certain vested interests, particularly agriculture. Um, didn't want to open up because it's all American and foreign farm products coming in. So he had one or two issues that he had to deal with in certain groups, but they weren't as powerful as the state enterprises today or some of the various vested interests in China that are very strong today. Now, fast forward to Xi Jinping. And I think one of the things that's very interesting is that there are a lot of very strong vested interests in China. And one of the things that he is trying to do when you look at what his overall program is, I won't go into all the details of his reform program, but at least I'll talk about a, a few of them. One of the things he's trying to do is to take on some of these vested interests, some of which are, are in the bureaucracy, some are in some of the large state owned enterprises and to make certain changes in China to reform the Chinese economy, open it up, make it more efficient, increase productivity, do a whole range of things that reduce this big buildup in, in debt uh, in China, which is commented on regularly by, uh, by commentators. And uh, in so doing, recognizing that the key to growth in China is not just stimulating the economy, although the Chinese will stimulate the economy to try to maintain growth and try to avoid inflation. We've seen that the Chinese have made certain decisions in the monetary area to do that. But he also is of the view that you can't just do it with traditional fiscal monetary policy. You have to make certain changes, certain major reforms in China. And I'll talk a little bit about those. But the thing he also has understood is that the the way China looks at the global economy also is very important to the reform process in China. And I would like to start by making a few comments about what he's doing uh, on the global scene, particularly on international economic policy, because I think that this is something we should bear in mind because it presents opportunities for the United States to work with China. There are those in this country who look at China and say, well, we really should adopt, adopt a policy similar to the one George Kennan advocated uh, at the beginning of the Cold War, and that is try to contain China. Look at China as an adversary, do what we can to, to stop the rise of China, to prevent the rise of China. That is a relatively small group, but there are nonetheless people who think that this is the way to approach China, that, you, that there's, there's going to be constant friction, that a rise in power is always going to have, uh, is always going to pose uh, major uh, uh, challenges for the established power, which is the United States. And if you begin to sort of look at China that way, there certainly will be bumps in the road, there certainly will be challenges, there certainly will be issues. But the other way of looking at it is, if these two countries can't get along, particularly in the economic area, but also in the area of national security, it's going to be harmful to both the United States and China and the rest of the world. So unless these two countries can figure out some way of working together in the Pacific but also globally, it's going to cause problems for the world economy. It's certainly going to adversely affect China and the United States. What Xi Jinping has done is quite interesting. Internally, he has established what he's called, or what are called, small leading groups. These are run by the party, and there are 11 of them, and Xi Jinping is the chair of each of them. And what is the idea? The idea behind it is not just to increase his power, although his power has grown very rapidly, and he now probably has more power than any party leader since Deng Xiaoping. Um, but it's not just that, it's that he has seen that the bureaucracy in China has gotten a little bit rigid, has, has sort of divided itself up into various groups, and the bureaucracy has not been able or willing to engage in the kind of creative change, the kind of bold change that he, Xi Jinping, and his group of people on the standing committee of the 
of the Politburo want to, um, want to um, institute in China. So he's established these small groups under the aegis of the party to try to pull together the powers in China and make the kinds of reforms that he's been talking about um, effective. That is to say, to make the kind of changes in China which will reduce some of the barriers to uh, reform that have been holding China back, have been causing this big increase in debt, have overregulated the economy, have caused a big decline in the productivity of capital, and he has now changed the structure of government. So what China's, uh, China's economic reforms are really about, in the first instance, is not just economic reform, but reform of governance. Because his view is, if you change the nature of governance in China, not the government of China, but governance in China, you will also be able to get at some of the factors that are causing the economy to experience these debt difficulties and inefficient use of capital and a wide range of other problems that are widely understood in China, including uh, environmental issues and a wide range of, of other issues. And, I'll talk a bit about those, but I think you have to look at the reforms in China, the economic reforms, as led first and foremost by a desire of, of Xi Jinping to change the governance of the country, and then once that's done or as part of that process, it'll be, it'll be easier to make some of the economic changes. So let me talk a little about the international economic policy for a moment, um, because this is very important. It's very important to understand one concept that you rarely hear about um, in the United States, but it is very prominent in China. And that is what the Chinese call a period of strategic opportunity, POSO. Um, it, it's rarely talked about in the commentary of the, United, in the American press, but it's important to understand. And that is that the Communist Party and Xi Jinping both have concluded that at the moment there are no major threats to the security of China. This is not to say there are not security problems. There clearly are issues. There are issues in the South China Sea. There are issues with Japan. There are issues with the United States in terms of the so-called pivot um, to Asia. There are certainly foreign policy and national security issues, but they are not in the view of Xi and his um, party uh, colleagues sufficient to cause China to feel threatened in a very fundamental way. And once you've concluded that, you've also concluded, as he has, that the key point for China now is to focus its energy on strengthening its economy internally and strengthening government reforms internally, not to use an inordinate amount of its resources on its military, although it is certainly increasing military spending. But the real strength of China, in his view, both now and for the future, is to, is to make sure the Chinese economy functions well and that China is strong internally. And in his view, an internally strong China is going to permit China to be a stronger nation externally, in part because it will have succeeded and impressed others by the example of delivering better benefits for the people of China, dealing with issues like incorporating large numbers of Chinese from rural China into the cities, dealing with the environmental issue, containing some of the debt issues that China is facing. If China can succeed in addressing its issues internally, it will be stronger externally. It rejects the notion, although it doesn't talk about it so much, it rejects the notion of uh, the kind of intervention that you're seeing by Russia and Ukraine. This is not something China talks about. It's not on their foreign policy or national security agenda. So, they're talking more about some of these issues in terms of what China can do in this period of strategic opportunity to strengthen the economy of China, recognizing that there are no major external threats at this point. So what does the world look like to 
President Xi Jinping and the Standing Committee of the Politburo and the leaders of China. He gave a very interesting speech before a foreign policy working group. A working group includes a very large number of people, very high level. These are held very irregularly. The last one of this level, where the where the president of China or the leader of the Communist Party spoke, was by uh, in 2006. President Hu Jintao uh, led the group at that point, and that was six years into Hu Jintao's presidency. This one took place two years after the inauguration of Xi Jinping. So one of the interesting things about Chinese foreign policy today is that they have spent so much time on it. Now, they don't look at this necessarily as going around just looking friendly and positive to their neighbors. But they recognize, on one hand, that the rise of China can be seen and in some cases has been seen as a threat to many of the countries on the periphery of China. So one of the reasons they're doing this, one of the reasons they're developing their relations with these countries is to demonstrate that they do want what they call win-win situations. And the first major trip to the region that he made was to, that, that uh, President Xi Jinping made was to Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, there is need for constant reform of the global system that growth and prosperity in the Asian region and the world is very much in the priority of China. And that he wants to utilize China's economic policy to be more proactive, more proactive particularly in Asia. So what has he done? In part, this is a reaction to the pivot by the United States, but it can't be looked at only that way because the Chinese have a very interesting and somewhat uh, cynical view of the pivot. If initially, they reacted to it and said, oh, the Americans are putting a few troops, a few Marines in Australia. They're probably going to be gearing up and have more of their naval exercises in, the, in, in, um, in Asia. But I don't think that they regard the pivot as a serious threat. In fact, over the last several years, including the last several months, military or its own mill-mill relations have actually improved. The United States and China have worked together on environmental issues. There have been a wide range of contacts uh, on energy cooperation, helping China to develop its, uh, its, its coal, clean coal, but even more particularly with um, new types of energy, alternative sources of energy, and even fracking, natural gas fracking, where the United States has actually been working with the Chinese. And in fact, there's a large Chinese investment in the United States, uh, in the eastern part of the United States, on natural gas fracking. So coal and energy in general, particularly natural gas, are areas where the, the two countries have been working together. The United States and China are also developing uh, a bilateral investment treaty. So there, there are a number of things that the Chinese are doing with the United States. But the Chinese have also concluded, as part of this multipolar world, that they want to have broader contacts with other areas of the world, and that is uh, the stands or the countries of Central Asia. Uh, President Xi also went to Indonesia and, and Malaysia. Uh, the Premier Li has been to a number of countries in Southeast Asia as well. So altogether what they've tried to do is reassure these countries that China wants, that the rise of China is not a threat to them and develop win-win situations. And what have they done besides these visits and very uh, constructive talk. One of the things that has been done is the uh, two initiatives that have been announced a while ago but were really underscored in this conference that took place in November, and that is the new Silk Road. One of them is a land Silk Road, which is an attempt to revive the old Silk Road that was established 
over 2,000 years ago under the Han Dynasty, where you had lots of, of um, trade between, at that point, Central Asia and China, but also under the, under the Yuan Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty was um, Kublai Khan and then Genghis Khan. The nomads that came from Mongolia actually established very, very dramatic trade routes between China and many other parts of the world. Persia, uh, the Mediterranean, and some Chinese goods actually during that period found their way um, under that dynasty through people like Marco Polo and others, all the way to Venice in general and Western Europe. So China has a history, uh, going back to the early stages of China, of trade with Central Asia, Western Europe, and the Mediterranean. So what China is looking for now is an opportunity to use these land routes and maritime routes, because there was also a big uh, maritime trade between China and many other parts of the world in the 1500s and the 1400s to increase opportunities for trade with many other parts of the world. This is quite a remarkable thing, and he's put up $40 billion for a Silk Road fund to finance infrastructure projects that will enhance Chinese trade with other parts of the world. So this is, I think, one of the very important elements of China's policy. It's not simply to take the world as it is. It's simply to say China now wants to have a proactive international economic policy, and the Maritime Silk Road and the Land Silk Road are going to be two key elements of this. China is also supported through a commitment of $50 billion to an infrastructure development bank, essentially for Asia, again, to finance infrastructure projects. Now, the United States has been very concerned about some of these because the argument in Washington is if you build these kinds of big projects, it will strengthen China's role in the region, and the rules will not be the same as those of the World Bank, so countries will get money more cheaply, and they won't have to adhere to the same tough terms that the World Bank requires in order to borrow money. The Chinese look at it differently. They look at it as an opportunity for them to strengthen their ties with the Asian region, Southeast Asia, South Asia uh, in particular. And, and I think one is going to see a more and more proactive set of policies by the Chinese in both of these areas. And in addition to that, China is supporting, the United States is, is negotiating something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. China has something called the Free Trade Area of Asia and the Pacific, where it's negotiating a free trade area or something tantamount to a free trade area with a number of other countries in the region. So this is the most proactive international economic policy that China has had since the Chinese Revolution. Um, you could say that joining the WTO was very proactive, but this is different in the sense that there, there are a whole range of initiatives all being put together in a very comprehensive way to strengthen Chinese trade with the region. There are two other reasons for this. One is instability in Xinjiang province. Xinjiang province is the western most province of China. Urumqi is the capital. It's inhabited by large numbers of Uyghurs who are Muslim. Uh, there's concern about um, Islamic radicalism there, and one of the things that China wants to do is strengthen the prosperity of Xinjiang province, and one way of doing it is to enhance its trade with other countries of the region, including uh, Central Asia. And another, although it's talked about a lot less, is to, in effect, offset Russian influence in some of these countries. Now, the, the Chinese have not verbalized this, but they regard this historically as an area of Chinese influence. And they're, they see what Russia has done in Ukraine. They're worried that in some of these countries there are large numbers of Russian speakers, there are large numbers of Russian speakers, and actual Russian nationals in Kazakhstan, but also in some of the other stands. So the Chinese don't want there to be any doubt that the real market, the real prosperity of these countries in the future lies in trade with China, not with Russia. And many of them also are providers of oil and gas. 
So as China attempts to diversify its supplies of oil and gas from the rest of the world, it wants to be able to have oil and gas from some of the countries in South Asia and Central Asia. And uh, they're building pipelines with some of these countries right now in order to get oil and gas from the region. So this part of China's policy is a very fundamental one in terms of not just China's increased global influence and particularly increased regional influence, and that is obviously a key priority, but it's also important in terms of the internal dynamics of Chinese growth. Increased trade, develop more secure supplies of oil and natural gas that can be piped in or brought in uh, through maritime connections using this maritime silk road, but it's part of a broader set of policies externally that are designed to strengthen China internally. And lastly, this strengthens the idea of per period of strategic opportunity, because if it can convince countries of the region that there are win-win situations, that they benefit from trade with China, <coughs> that as China grows, they will grow because there will be more trade between these countries and China, it will help to increase stability in the region as these countries grow and help to deal with their internal problems, but it will also make them feel less concerned about the rise of China and less threatened. And if they do, instead of developing partnerships with other countries, they will have closer ties with China. So it creates an environment in the region of China that is more economically stable and closer to China from a political and a national security perspective. So this is something that's very interesting, very new. Uh, there have been elements of this in the past, but uh, at this conference in November, Xi Jinping put this all together into a framework of a more active set of, of uh, relations between China and its neighbors and the rest of the world. Now, internally, obviously, there are very uh, significant challenges to China. And the, 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 the biggest challenge well, there are several big challenges, but let me just touch on a few of them. One of them is the issue of corruption. This is by no means a trivial issue in China because there is a lot of corruption. The Chinese government, the last leader of China, Hu Jintao, said that this could be do severe damage to the Chinese Communist Party if this corruption were allowed to continue. Xi Jinping has gone after corruption and has taken some very bold action. Now, it's controversial. Not everyone agrees. Some argue that it may be overdone. Some argue that it hasn't been. It's controversial in China. It's controversial among international observers. But by and large, it's relatively popular in China because I think a lot of people in China saw this corruption. And it did cause a certain amount of, of discontent and a certain amount of unrest in certain parts of China. But that's something that you can read about and get a better sense on your own as to what you think of it and whether you think it's too much or not enough or just about right. What's very interesting and what gets less, far less attention is that one of the objectives is to change the way the national government, the central government of China works with local government. And this to me is really one of the fascinating elements of Chinese reform today. And that is this. There's been sort of an implicit bargain in China. And that is that the leaders of local governments, that could be the party leader in a province or in a city or the mayor of a city or the governor of a province, regional leaders were largely responsible for making sure that there was dramatic growth in their province or in their city. And leaders who were promoted were often promoted on the grounds that they had done well, they had succeeded in creating a great deal of prosperity in their, in their region or in their city. Um, and this had been true uh, for a while. And if you got 7 or 8 percent growth, you were noticed in Beijing. And I think it's important to take a look at this because in the United States, and there's a very interesting difference between the structure in the United States and the structure in China. In China, 
the cities and states didn't have the capacity to tax. So how did they get money? They would get money by taking land uh, often from peasants and selling it to some industrialist who wanted to build a factory. The government would get money, and to some degree, people who were leaders in the region would skim it off. And therefore, it was part of the, of the corruption problem. The government now has said, this is going to change. It's going to change because now certain, not all, but many of the regions will be able to issue bonds, like municipal bonds here, Chinese version of municipal bonds. And they will have tax, some taxing authority. And they will get money from the government. So the, the government won't just mandate certain things. It will give them money to fulfill the mandates. And that a second way of looking at these provinces is not just how much growth there is, but how they deal with environmental issues. So you're going to be rated as a leader of a province, not just on whether you can achieve 7 or 8 percent growth or whatever number, but whether you're able to address the environmental issues there in a constructive way. Because the environmental issues, you hear about protests in China, and there are a lot of them. Most of them are about environmental issues or or governments, local governments, taking land from peasants. If you can deal with the land taking issue, and you can deal with the environmental issue in regional parts of China, rural China, and some of these new, newly expanding cities, you can help to deal with some of the potential unrest, and you can also enhance prospects for prosperity, because you won't get money going to projects just because someone has some influence with a party leader, Money will go to projects, presumably, and this still remains to be tested, that fulfill certain economic criteria of being profitable, and therefore the utilization of money in a productive fashion will be a focal point rather than simply utilizing money to, um, shall we say, provide support for projects that influential local party leaders support, but which may not have very much economic benefit. So a lot of the regional changes in China are going to be very important. Again, this is where governance and economic progress come together. If you make sure that the economy and that money is used in an efficient way, you reduce corruption um, because you take the politics out of the flow of money. You are able to deal with some of these environmental issues in a much more effective way. And the credibility of local governments is increased because there is a great deal of transparency um, that will now be in the, introduced in the process. There will be websites, and local leaders will have to put on the website how they're using the money they get from taxes or from bonds or from, or from the government. So certain changes are underway. Now, is this going to solve all the problems of China? Of course it won't. But it is very dramatic and a very important series of changes. The other relates to the changes in the legal system. And that is, instead of having only local courts, you're going to have circuit courts. Now, why are you going to have circuit courts? You're going to have circuit courts because you reduce the parochialism of the, of the judicial system by having not just a judge who's close to the mayor of a given city or the party leader of a given province, by having circuit courts, these courts will have two or three provinces under their jurisdiction. The objective is to make sure that these circuit courts do not um, are not forced by local political pressures to render decisions which are supportive of a given party secretary in a given city or a given region. So a lot of these changes are, are taking place at a, at a very uh, fundamental level. Can they be done overnight? Absolutely not. But is the process underway? The answer is it is. The last point, um, and there are many more parts of this, but I'm just identifying a few that are particularly interesting, is the role of the private sector. Um, if you look at the language that came out of the third plenum, which was the plenum that was held to talk about economic reform in China a couple of years ago, and more recent decisions, they use the word, the role of the market in allocating resources will be decisive. The market will play the decisive role in the allocation of resources. 
Now, this is something that we have never heard before. It's there was always a smart play. Some old various uh, adjectives were used. Decisive has not been used. Now it is being used. Now, this doesn't mean that state enterprises won't be around. State enterprises are still very powerful. And they're going to be powerful for a period of time. Many of them have very close ties to the Communist Party. Many of them play key roles in the energy sector and other very important sectors of the economy. But the idea behind the role of the market is to allow uh, a, a greater degree of efficiency in the allocation of capital, and particularly to enable small and medium-sized enterprises to be established and to grow. And one of the things that the Chinese government has done is to uh, eliminate the requirement that you have to have a certain amount of capital, they call registered capital, in order to start a small or medium-sized company. That used to be a major inhibition to people because many of these entrepreneurs didn't have enough capital to meet the registration requirements of the government. The government's now virtually eliminated this. And as a result, there has been a 20% increase in the number of small businesses established over the last year, in 2014. So, not, obviously, not all of them are going to succeed, just as happens in the United States. But the Chinese government sees if you, that if you want to establish new businesses, you have to make it easier from a regulatory point of view. And the other part is now the government the regulators in addition to the government waiving these requirements for registered capital, there are going to be a lot of other regulations in China. Um, they'll be eliminated, or at least dramatically reduced. So these are the kind of internal reforms that are taking place in China. So let me conclude by talking about how this all affects the United States, because it is going to have a very important effect on Chinese economic relations with the United States. And it's something that a number of American companies can benefit from, but the China market is not necessarily an easy one. Uh, it's a, it, and it's not even that growing as rapidly as in the past, as you've seen in the paper. There's concern about deflation. There's concern that the growth will drop too far below the target rate of 7%. There are a whole lot of, and there are a whole lot of regulatory challenges. There are issues related to intellectual property protection. There are issues related to trade secrets. There are a wide range of issues. So and I don't want to leave the impression that it's easy and American firms are going to have a great time of it all. But a lot of American firms have done quite well in China, but they want to have the opportunity to feel, and the Chinese need this, if they're going to find, and the Chinese now are finding, that a lot of their labor-intensive production is no longer as competitive in the rest of the world as it has been in the past. They need higher value added production to uh, absorb the number of workers that are coming off the farms into the cities and need jobs. So if they're going to get jobs to absorb these workers, they're going to have to get companies, not companies that produce cheap shoes and toys and other things, because a lot of them are moving to Bangladesh or Vietnam. They have to have new kinds of companies that hire these people, and many of them require a greater degree of skill than these, the, these shoe producers or toy producers. So if they're going to do that, they're going to have to get very high-end production, or at least medium production. And that means that no company is going to make a major investment in new technology in China unless there's protection of intellectual property. So the Chinese, and the Chinese now have their own companies that are producing intellectual property as well. So Gradually in China, the rules to protect intellectual property are improving, and over a period of time, if that improvement lasts and is credible, then a new kind of American investment is going to take place, and that will be American investment, which has a larger degree of intellectual property attached to it, and American companies that heretofore have been unwilling to have Chinese partners because of fear that the Chinese uh, partner will take their technology or their business secrets and then the American company will be left with nothing. Some of that is, at least in the minds of the Chinese leaders, going to be addressed because they need more private investment and they need more sort of middle level investment and they know they're not going to get it unless there's some improvement in intellectual property. This is proven to be difficult. It's not happening all at once. 
but there at least is an awareness on the part of the leaders of China that they need to do something about it. The other part that is newer and, and even more interesting, and I'll close with this, is Chinese investment in the United States. This is something you don't hear very much about, but there has been, um, last year, something between 12 and 13 billion dollars worth of Chinese investment in the United States. Now this is not large compared to British investment in the United States, or French investment, or Canadian investment, or Japanese investment. But the fact is that it is increasing, and it is changing in terms of what the Chinese are buying. And this, I think, is particularly important to bear in mind. Half of the investment is in information and communication technology. This is something that you didn't have before. Now, it has to pass the test of CFIUS, um, which is a committee chaired by the Treasury's uh, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which weeds out certain investment that has national security implications. But even with certain things being weeded out by the CFIUS process, you still have a lot of Chinese investment going on in the area of information communication technology. There's investment in real estate. There's investment in hotels. The biggest movie chain in the United States, many people don't know, is owned by a Chinese company. AMC is owned by the Chinese company called Wanda. Um, so um, most Americans are not aware of this. Most Chinese here, I'm sure, are. So, uh, but but it's not just it's not just that. There are a whole range of companies, and what the Chinese are doing now is they realize they can't just sell low wage products. They've got to move up the product line. And that means partnering with American high-tech companies, learning management skills and middle-level companies. And in many cases, Chinese are reluctant to buy products made in China. So you get, for instance, a Chinese company because of poor standards, health standards, poor uh, regulations. So you get the Chinese company buying Smithfield Foods. And what are they going to buy? They're not just buying it so they can sell hams in the United States. They're buying it so that they can go back to China and say, here's a ham made in the United States, sold to you by a Chinese company. So they're branding themselves in China by being able to market American-made products through their own Chinese distribution network, which is a very interesting phenomenon that you wouldn't have thought of. The same is, is true with baby food, by the way. A lot of Chinese parents don't want to serve uh, Chinese-made baby food, so a lot of Chinese companies are importing American-made or New Zealand-made or Australian-made or Hong Kong-made baby food in China. So this is really part of a very, very different type of arrangement between the United States and China. And the United States and China are negotiating a bilateral investment treaty. And this is going to be, it's not something that's going to be done today or tomorrow. Peter is very aware of this since he worked on it when he was in the Commerce Department. And um, we had thought it might be done a little bit more quickly, but things take time. But the idea behind it is that it will give Chinese a greater sense of security about their investment in the United States, and it will give Americans um, a much clearer idea of what they can invest in and what they can't invest in in China which will eliminate a lot of the bureaucracy uh, when it comes to the, uh, the approval process in China. The, the goal is to have China come up with a very short negative list so that American companies, when they look at China, will know that there are certain areas that they can't invest in, but in all those areas that are not on the negative list, they can. And this will dramatically reduce the bureaucracy. It reduces corruption since you won't have all sorts of um, regulatory participation by the party or government leaders in the process of, uh, of making those decisions on what's to be invested in. So, as a result of all this, there are real opportunities for the United States and China to work together. It's not something that's going to happen quickly, but when you look at Chinese foreign policy and you look at what the United States wants to do in terms of trying to strengthen ties with China, there are a great many opportunities. The Chinese are clearly going to be a formidable competitor. They're clearly going to want to play a much greater role in the Asian region. They're developing these new institutions of cooperation with other parts of Asia. And we have to bear in mind, this is a powerful country which wants to play a greater global role. 
On the other hand, there are many opportunities between the United States and China in the economic area, in military cooperation, and making sure that there is freedom of navigation on the high seas, which is the interest of the United States and China. So we shouldn't look at China as an adversary. We should, should look at it as a competitor, but we also need to look at China as a country that provides, as a result of its growth, and as a result of its <coughs> desire to play a greater role in the global economy, a country that we have the opportunity, if we have the right kind of policies um, on trade, on investment, on opening up our economy to Chinese investment, on cooperation on environmental issues, we have numerous opportunities for, uh, for genuine progress. Thank you very much.
they're going to have to make a very tough choice. On one hand, they want Chinese companies to be more competitive. On the other hand, there are very strong views about the government controlling information and controlling the internet. And how they reconcile this is going to be a big challenge. Now, there are those that say, well, this is temporary. They're going to do some, take some measures to restrain uh, the, or restrict access to the global internet. But the more they do this, the more harmful it's going to be to Chinese companies. And all these small and medium-sized enterprises that need global information are going to find it hard to get. And even the bigger companies, if you're in the energy business, you've got to know what energy prices are. You've got to know, you've got to be able to get information about what's going on in Saudi Arabia or Qatar. And if you're cut off from that information, it certainly constrains your ability to do business. So it's, it's a big dilemma. It's a big dilemma for American companies and a big dilemma for China. And, and the last point is, we did make a very strong point in all these strategic and economic dialogues with the Chinese about the protection of intellectual property. This, for most American companies, their comparative advantage is intellectual property. And if the intellectual property of American companies is at risk as a result of partnerships with the Chinese or as a result of investment in China, um, whether that's in China or here, it's going to be very harmful to American companies. And so the Chinese, if they want to get high-end investment, they're going to have to protect intellectual property. And if they are unwilling or unable to do that, it's going to cost their economy a lot of potential growth. Okay. More questions? Yes. Right. This gentleman here. Yes. Right there. I wanted to go back to the issue of the bureaucracy and the attempt to reform the bureaucracy. And I assume that means, you know, includes the government, the party, the state-owned industries. And how realistic is, is that? When has is, when is a bureaucracy ever really been reformed without, you know, taking people out and shooting them or something? Is this, is this just a pipe dream? You're asking a very good question. Having been in Washington for the last four years or so, <laughs> my wife Catherine and I discuss this on a regular basis. Um, and it is very hard to do. I mean, the fact is that if you look at Washington, we've got a, a bureaucracy which can be uh, stultifying at times. And, um, and China has a similar set of problems. Now, can they resolve it? I, I don't have any illusions that they're going to be able to do this quickly. Uh, but I think what they are trying to do by establishing these small leading groups that are, by, that are under the party and not under the government. And this is something, when you talk to an American audience, and people say, well, so especially, what are you talking about? You know? But there's a big difference between a group that's led by the party and groups that's, that's led by government officials. We don't have that kind of thing here. The party makes all the appointments. party makes the appointments. Right. Your job depends on the party. That's right. Your job depends on the party. So you've got to, so the party is really trying to get these groups together to be able to, to, to generate change in the bureaucracy. The party appoints everyone it wants to appoint. So it's not as if the party doesn't play a role in appointing government officials. But a lot of government officials, when they get in, tend to have you know, be in silo positions where they're one's responsible for this area, one's responsible for that area. And I think the idea is to try to create a greater degree of, of, of competition in China and cross some of these uh, bureaucratic boundaries, which tend to hold back, uh, hold back um, innovation. There's no easy answer to this problem. And it's, in, in a country that is as big as China, to be able to make changes in the governance process is a very, is a very challenging thing. So I don't believe it's, it's an easy thing, but it's certainly something the government is aware of. But they do have the opportunity with respect to provincial and municipal governments to make some very important changes. And I think that's where you're going to see the, uh, the, the significant changes that I've mentioned. And, and 
It won't again be every province all at once or every city all at once, but they'll pick individual provinces to focus on or individual cities to focus on. And I think you'll see you'll see more of that. It's already begun to happen. And that will change things. And that will deal with the debt issue, and we'll deal with the corruption issue, and we'll deal with the environmental issue. Not a panacea. None of this is a panacea. None of it's easy. The Chinese leaders know that, but they're one has to really look at the direction in which they're moving and the fact that it has the support of the standing committee of the Politburo of the Communist Party. That in itself at least demonstrates considerable progress from where we were three years ago. Okay, yes, Carol. I'm sorry, you mic. I, I wondered if you would just say a few words about Taiwan and Hong Kong. Well, Taiwan, I think we just have to wait until the China Taiwan elections and see what what happens. Um, and Hong Kong, you know, the Chinese and the government of Hong Kong have a pretty good understanding on the, sort of the boundaries of what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, and, and it's pretty well known that a massive demonstration in Hong Kong that lasts for a long time and causes problems in Beijing probably is not going to be as effective as trying to work things out on a more, on a quieter basis. So I, I, I don't know what, when, what more one can say about Hong Kong except the fact that I think the leadership of Hong Kong and the over the course of the last several decades of pragmatic solution. Yes, in the back, Phil Roeder, chairman of our political science department. Uh, you, you gave a very fine overview of America's relationship in economics, and you touched on security relations, but a third part of our relationship, or at least our foreign policy, has focused on political developments in other countries, and in particular, the movement towards democracy, civil society, and political liberties. The impression from the popular press is that China has made a sharp retrenchment in those areas in recent years. Is your understanding that this might negatively impact our relationship with China in the future? You know, what, what the United States is constantly <laughs> trying to strike the right balance between attempting to address the broader strategic issues between the United States and China and demonstrating concern about social issues, human rights, and a variety of other issues. Over a period of time, this, this is not, as you well know, a new, a new question. It's not one that has been, um, that has not been addressed in the past. I don't think there's any easy answer that is going to be perfect. They have a system that's very different from our own. Their concern about stability is something that runs deep into the history of China. It is very hard for us to make uh, prescriptions in, to the Chinese about what their human rights policy ought to be. The United States does on a regular basis, and I'm not the administration anymore, the United States does on a regular basis comment on social issues in China, comment on issues of freedom of speech, comment on issues that relate to the internet, comment on a wide range of issues. But it, it, it rarely, if ever, gets to the point where it leads to a confrontation that would undermine many other aspects of the relationship. And I think that's the way most governments have played it. It's, it's one thing to talk about these various things, but the, the, the broader importance of the relationship creates certain parameters within which these debates on social issues take place uh, between the United States and China. And, um, and that, I think, is going to continue to be the way the U.S. government plays it. Look, if you go back, go back to the period where normalization began, you know, you, you had, uh, you had uh, the Cultural Revolution, you had uh, a whole
whole range of things that were going on that were very tough on the average Chinese citizen. And yet the United States, leaders of both parties, concluded that, that while these things were occurring and people were aware they were occurring, it was still important to move ahead with a broader and more fundamental relationship. So there have been, there have been periods of time where these social or internal issues have arisen, but they've never been allowed to get to the point where they've caused a rupture in the relationship or a major confrontation in the relationship. A good, a student. <laughs> My student. <laughs> then we know it will be a very good question. <laughs> well, so first of all, we're honored to uh, ask a questions. Um, so my question is like in terms of you mentioned uh, technology companies in China, like that I know like, uh, for example, if in the future, more and more technology uh, company will enter in China, but at the same time, I don't think China's like technology will catch up. So in that case, they will result in their terms like a lot of like Chinese government want to protect the, their own local companies. For example, they will happen will reason to see the Qualcomm was fined like billions of dollars for you know monopoly stuff. So I'm just wondering how um, how do you like think this things in the future uh, uh, will be and uh, what like the US government can do or what Chinese government can do to kind of like uh, solve this problem. This, the, the problem you're trying to solve is what though? What is, what is, the, what is the issue? I'm anxious for American companies. Yeah. Um, you know, American companies have, have been able the access of American companies to China has been quite remarkable over the last 20 years or so. I mean, almost every major American technology company has invested in China or is selling in China today. I think the issue is not so much whether those companies are going to be able to continue to play a role in China, but I think the bigger danger for for them and for the Chinese is that the Chinese, over a period of time, if they're going to get higher end investment, are going to find it more difficult to do if these companies are fearful that their intellectual property will be pirated. This is a dilemma for the companies, clearly, and for the Chinese, because a lot of American companies withhold the very best technology that they have because they're fearful that it will get pirated so they don't they don't um, they don't send it to China, they don't invest in companies in, in factories that incorporate that technology. So it, it it is it is an issue, but what's happening over a period of time is that the Chinese technology is not, as you correctly point out, going to achieve the same level as American technology overnight. But there is more and more innovation going on. And over a period of time, I think you're going to find that some Chinese companies, at least, not all, but some, want their intellectual property protected. Now, I don't have any doubt that it's still going to be a challenging environment for American companies. And I think that, that uh, there's no panacea, there's no easy answer to this. The Chinese are going to have to come to the conclusion, if they want to, if they don't have very strong protection of intellectual property or trade secrets, investment that they want and need will not simply not take place. And that's the reality. And I think, I think American officials have to be candid with the Chinese and put it to them very simply. If they want higher investment, there has to be a high level of confidence that intellectual property will be protected. If you poll most American companies today, they would tell you that they do not have that confidence. And not having that confidence means that there will be certain investments that they will not make because they'll be fearful of piracy. And it's a blunt answer, but it's the honest answer at this point. Thanks so much. I'm afraid we've uh, reached the, uh, uh, the end of